Spirit that we could carry with us, that we could use in our everyday lives to, to reach others, to show you to other people and introduce you to them, Lord. Father, we thank you once again for this time, for this fellowship, for each and every person here, and the wonderful things you do in our lives, and just for everything that you are and who you are, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. So we're going to have you turn uh, Fridays at 7 p.m. You turn Fridays at 7 p.m. There's a free marriage conference coming up uh, October 29, 8 in the morning to 4 p.m. Not 4 to 8 p.m. With Lynn and Linda Colby of Calvary Houston. Uh, they've been counseling couples and ministering to marriages for over 20 years. Make sure that you sign up in the back. It's very important that we know who plans on attending. Turn off your cell phones, put them on buzz, or uh, silence them. Offering boxes left and right in the rear. Pastor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. There you go. That was a little bit better. It's like, man, the coffee has not kicked in for some of you. Isn't that funny? And it's like, you know, everybody's expecting us to respond. That's not what we came here for. Um, let's see, announcements that I'm doing. Uh, so just a reminder, um, we need Sunday school workers, even if it's just for um, a quarter or a period of time. Um, we're not asking you to give your life away, but, you know, you can make an eternal difference in someone's growth um, as a believer in Jesus Christ. So, um, so if you're interested in being involved in children's church, you know, um, please uh, see Stephanie. Um, most of you know who she is. If you don't, then you're in trouble. Um, so a uh, reminder, there is not a men's fellowship this coming Tuesday. We changed it to where it's the Tuesday before third Wednesday. So it's sometimes. It just depends on when the month starts. So, yeah. Well, yeah, Tuesday before third Wednesday. So it's not this coming Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. All right. So be there or be square, gentlemen. Um, maybe we'll see if we can, like, uh, uh, get some good beef jerky or something like that and sit around and chew on it and act like men. All right. So, uh, but just act like it. Let's pray right now. Father, we come to you and we thank you for this time together. And, um, man, just for what you're doing in our lives. Um, for us to be able to come before you and be real, just to be um, totally caught up in you, totally, uh, Lord, um, caught by you and touched by you. And we pray as we, um, Father, as we find these things and as we do these things that, that you would be among us, that, um, Lord, that we would be caught up and know that you have saved us. So help us to see what's going on today in this in the scriptures. And we just give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you would, please um, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 11. <clears throat> and last time we saw where Peter had defended um, the grace that had been shown to the Gentiles. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, it's pretty neat seeing how he did that and the things that happened with that. But one of the things that kind of got to me as we were coming into this particular section of what's happening with the gospel and where it's going out and how it's going out is some of the questions that I get from people sometimes, even just kind of looking at scriptures like this. Sometimes people will ask me questions like, you know, what does this mean? What does that mean? What does being a Christian mean? You know, um, does, it, does it mean that I just worship God in my own way? What does it mean when I say Christian? What does that mean? How do I know I am one? And to me, that's kind of an amazing thing and a kind of almost a shocking statement sometimes. And, and that's kind of what we're going to get into with this. And, you know, and I do know and understand, man. I, I don't want to make it seem like I know everything and then this is how it needs to be. But there are certain things the Scripture says that are very plain, very stated, and that, you know, I think you should be able to look at and go, okay, this is how, you know, A is B is C is D. Sometimes Scripture does do that so that it's very plain to us so that we understand. Um, does that mean we won't make mistakes? Does that mean things won't happen, et cetera, et cetera? We'll, we'll kind of get into that as we go. But right now, 
Um, I first want to, I'm going to break this up into three parts, and we'll kind of go over those parts as we do it. And right now, let's look at the gospel unleashed in verses 19 through 21. Because we had seen where at the end in verse 18, everybody said, oh, the gospel has spread to the Gentiles. You know, hey, how cool is that, right? And it was kind of like a, you know, hey, great, yay, good for the Gentiles. And they kept going to the Jews, and we're going to see that right now. Verse 19. In those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, uh, preaching to the word to no one but the Jews only. Um, you know, so just stop right there. And that becomes one of those things as we look at this. Back in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, you know, we saw this persecution break out. And everybody scattered like, like rats, right? Everybody just went poof all over the kingdom. Um, and it says here that they went as, you know, they've traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Most of those are still around the Mediterranean. Some of them, like um, Antioch is in Syria, which is just north of Israel. Okay, but it's still kind of along the Mediterranean coast. And Antioch was, was a huge city. It was like the third largest city in the Roman Empire. So, and that's ginormous. You know, there was estimates that sometimes the population at that time would be over 500,000 people, which is huge for an ancient city, okay? Um, and, and then like Cyprus, beautiful island out in the middle uh, uh, of the ocean, but also a very port city. And if any of you have ever been in the Navy, you know how port cities can be, right? But Phoenicia, um, that was like, you know, it was kind of along the coast of the Mediterranean as well, and it was almost... Most of it was made up of Canaanites and people like that. And basically, they just, it was separated by all these weird mountains and valleys and things. And basically, uh, they lived like, it was like the, it was like, they were like the hillbillies of Canaan. Okay? So, it, it was like, they live up there on them mountains, but yet the mountains were on the coast. So, they were hillbilly pirates kind of people. You know, but, it, you know, it was, uh, it, these are the people that they're going out to. And you got to remember, because they are Jews, they are very industrious, and they, they go places, and they create their own community within a community, and then, you know, live and make money. And they were very good at it, okay? Um, and so everybody scatters, and they go out and start taking the gospel out, but they're only going to the Jews. You and I read that, and we kind of think of it as standoffish, but it's not really. Because with many of the Jews and things, you know, Jesus was a Jew. You and I have to remember that. That's tough to remember sometimes for us because he has ingratiated us so well and he has shown us his grace and he has brought us in. And, you know, but he was a Jew. And at that time when he was here, he kept himself separate. He followed the law. He went to temple. He did what he was commanded to do as a follower of the Jewish faith. He obeyed the law more perfectly than any man ever had or ever will. He obeyed it perfectly. He was, the Bible says, without sin. But you and I know, see, because we've seen the beginning and the end of the movie because we have it right here, right? So we've got the spoilers, okay? These guys, they don't know what's going on. They don't understand that Jesus is, is, is that part of the thread that, that takes salvation from the very beginning and threads it to the end and brings us to where we are now. You and I understand that he is the savior of the whole world. That's one of the things that they're going to talk about when they get into it with each other. They're going to, you know, Paul is going to say like in Ephesians, he's going to say, is God not the God of the Gentiles too? Isn't he? And these are the arguments that these guys are going to get into, and they're going to get into this. But right now, for them, the clear thing is that they are to bring the gospel to the Jews. Even, remember, uh, Peter, when he voted another apostle in, it was because they had to witness to the 12 tribes of Israel. That was their whole purpose. He he saw the whole purpose of the apostles, you know, because number one, they were the foundations of the new Jerusalem, right? But they also had to witness to the 12 tribes. So that's kind of their mentality, but they forgot, man, because of their teaching. And it's the same thing that we can see a lot in, like, who was it I was talking to this morning? Um, I think I was talking with uh, uh, Mike and Jehu, and we were just talking about how 
re- religiosity can really take you down a bad road. You know, there are certain churches, they've just always done it this way. You know, and because I do it this way, you know, that's the way granddaddy did it. That's just the way we're going to do it, y'all. Right? So, and, and that's what's kind of going on here. And they have lost teaching. Because these people aren't reading their Bibles anymore. They aren't going through it. They're just hearing what's being given to them. That's why you guys can't just come here on a Sunday morning and expect to grow as Christians. You can't. I can encourage you. I can share with you. You can see how we can look at the scriptures together so that you can understand them better. But if you're not having a relationship with him outside of this time, you're a mess. And you are going to be the same as them. You're going to be led not by the word of God, not by the Holy Spirit, but by your religious convictions. And that could be a dangerous thing. These guys have forgotten what Isaiah 11.10 said, where he said, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, that's Jesus, right? Who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Man, the Gentiles are going to seek this guy. And the Jews... They're still, even as followers of Jesus Christ, are going, yay Jew, right? Because that's just that's where they are. Now, they come into this and they begin, you know, again, like we said, when they, when they scattered, they all ran. They took everything they had. And, and kind of think about that. You know, you and I, we, we kind of, we, you know, we become believers in Jesus Christ. And most of us, you know, it's like, okay, I gave my life to Jesus at church this Sunday. So now I can go join this club or that club or you know, hey, you know, I'll be accepted into certain places now because now I'm a, I'm a person, right? I'm a, I'm a gentleman in the community or something like that, right? You know, uh, there are some clubs where they won't let us in anymore or some clubs where we probably shouldn't be going, but that's another story, okay? Um, but most of these guys, they're coming into this and they've given everything up. I mean, whole families are having to bolt out of Jerusalem, and they're going to these towns, and most of them are port towns, and notice they're not going to the outlying areas. They're not going to the sticks, okay? They're going to the main cities because that's where they, that's, because from the main cities is where it goes out to the, you know, lesser places, to the out of towns and to the sticks. But that's where they're going, and they go to these places where they're going to be sharing with Jews that are then going to be traveling all over the planet. They're beginning to obey what Jesus said in the beginning of the book of Acts. Look at verses 20 and 21. And it says, But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now, the Greek here gets a kind of little weird and a little strange as we begin to read it and, you know, kind of explain it to you as we do, because some of your versions may even say different things. Some of your versions may say they had come and they preached to the Greeks, some of your versions may say. Um, some of your versions may, you know, say slightly different things, and that's because there's a couple of different texts that have been found that say different things right here. Um, some manuscripts say it differently but the greek as you read it even in the you know the version that i'm reading the way it says it and this is how i kind of want to read it to you as we do this because you know like we like i said cyprus is an island cyrene is actually in africa it's still on the coast you know of the mediterranean but it's actually up in africa um and then of course antioch is in syria okay that's actually the capital of syria All right, so here's what's happening as I'm reading this, okay? It's like, how do I explain it? Where it makes sense. These people are coming from these towns and they're coming to these Jews. Remember who the Hellenists are. They're the Greek-speaking Jews. But most of them grew up in Greek cities or as Greeks. Even Paul grew up in Tarsus. Okay, so he was mostly he was kind of he was more he was more Greek in the sense of, you know, how he grew up than he was Jewish. And then here you got these sailors and you got these Gentiles coming from all these port cities and they're coming to trade here in Antioch. And they're talking to the Hellenists because the Hellenists will talk to them because they all speak Greek and, you know, they accept them as 
compatriots, cities, citizens, whatever. And they're going and they're sharing with them. And these Hellenists, they're not, you know, they're not separationists. They're not, you know, Jews only kind of club. So when they're sharing with these sailors, they're like, yeah, Jesus, man, saved me. And they're like, Jesus saved you? Would Jesus save me? Yeah, Jesus will save you. And then they begin to share Jesus with them, and people are getting saved. It says right there, the hand of the Lord was with them. In verse 21, and a great number turned and believed. So what's happening here is they're coming in, and they're talking to people that are just like them. And they say, just like us, you can be saved. It's as simple as it was. The hand of the Lord that it says there is a very specific term. Most of us would read it and just go, yes, the Lord is saving people. That's kind of what he's doing. But it's a very particular statement, and it's a very Jewish idiom as we read. In Exodus, it tells us that we see the hand of the Lord is moving on the people in Exodus when he's effecting these miracles and he's doing these things to bring Israel out of Egypt. In Joshua 4.24, it said, The powerful hand of the Lord can destroy and it can heal. Over and over and over again, we see throughout the scriptures that the power, the hand of the Lord, when it affects and when it reaches out, there's almost nothing that can stop it. Even our will and our desire to just, I want to have my own way, I want to do my own thing, Lord. And he goes, yeah, let's move this clay around and... I'm going to mold you, and you go, mm, no, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in my ways. And he goes, okay, well, let's break that off, and then we'll, and, you know, because his hand is upon you, and he's going to do his work in you. The Bible even tells us that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it to the end. So, guys, even if you're at a place where you're like, Jesus, I just don't think you can do anything with, more with me. I just can't change, Lord. I can't stop. You know, or I can't do this, or I can't go on, or I can't. And he's just he's like, I understand. That's why you're not going to do it. I'm going to do it anyway. Here he comes into this, and we see this, and we see the hand of the Lord is upon people. And guys, we've got to understand, these are people who believe in multitudes of gods. Who believe in, in so many things. They understand the nature of sacrifice. Many of them make sacrifices to their own gods. They know what it means, but here it says not just a few people are saved, but a great many. The idea in that is a crowd that can't be counted. And these aren't apostles saving them. It's not even deacons that were appointed by apostles. It's dudes and dudettes that ran from Jerusalem and are now just sharing their simple faith here in Antioch, and people by the truckloads are getting saved. Why? Because they're sharing with them, and they're sharing the grace of God with them. Not just a few but a great many. And look at what it says there. Look at that verse again. It says they believed and turned to the Lord. What does that word, what does that turn mean? It means to repent. That's basically what repentance means. It means to have that regret, that change of mind, that change of heart. It's to turn from where you were. It's a common term that is used over and over again in the scripture to talk about repentance. Repentance. I was going this way, and now I'm going this way. Yeah, it means that it's doing a 180, guys. It's reversing our course. It's turning, the Bible talks about it, turning from darkness to light. Turning from your own way to Jesus. The word repent in the scriptures is metaneo. And, it, and it's beautiful, and it talks about the idea of a change of and that's something that he calls you and I to do. Psalm twenty two twenty seven says, the in, you know, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. And so when the writer of Acts is writing this, he's like, these people, guys, these people are turning to the Lord. And that's the same thing that you and I can experience if we share with people that don't know him. We can say, you can turn to the Lord. And, and we don't have to do it. I don't have to talk them into the kingdom. I don't have to talk them into believing in Jesus Christ. I just got to share him and let him do his thing. But the idea here of turning is that repentance. And that's a thing that seems to be missing a lot from, you know, from a lot of common walks and a common feature in the church today. 
is we've kind of forgotten about repentance. We've kind of put it off to the side. It's not something that we really look at anymore. What does it mean to turn from sin? It means just that, turning from it. We just talked about it. How can they, what are they turning from? That's exactly it. They're turning to Jesus. They're turning to him. It doesn't mean they become perfect or sinless, right? You know, we talked about that before. Is anybody here perfect or sinless? No, not a single one of us. That's why we turn to him, because we need him. I need him. I need that sacrifice for myself. How do we know? And that's the thing, man, because I've talked to people who, who are struggling in their faith and struggling in their life and, and their, their walk with the Lord. And, and they go, I, I want to turn. I want to turn from the things of this world. I, I want to I be good. I want to be holy. I want to do this. And then I'm like, you know, and, and it kind of becomes that little catch in their head, you know, because. All right. If, if this is Jesus, right. That's Jesus. The cup, you know, because he's full and he overflows, right? He overflows to us, okay? Thanks for leaving the cup up there. All right. So, but, you know, okay, so we've got this cup, and that's Jesus, okay? It's Jesus. Hey, Jesus, what's up? All right, he's over there. All right, and then let's say this plant, because it's dead, okay? It's not, it's not alive, it's dead. That's sin, which is sin is death, right? Okay. Now, here's the, here's the mistake you and I make a lot when we're supposed to be following Jesus. Because it says, it, you know, to repent is not just to turn away from that. Because if that's my sin, you know, and I go, ha ha, I have turned from my sin. What am, I, what am I missing here, God? And that's right. You see, it's not about not sinning. Because that becomes a big trap in the Christian mind. And you're just like, you can't sin. You can't do this. It's like, no, 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 no. Hmm. Well, I want to turn to him. Because if I'm turned to him and I'm walking towards him, then I'm walking away from that. It's a natural course of my life as a believer in Jesus Christ. But I can't walk towards him if I haven't been born again because I can't see him. I don't know where he is. And that's what they're coming into and they're saying, guys, listen. Jesus died for our sins and he rose again from the dead. And if you believe in him, you'll never die. And they repented and turned to Jesus. Have you turned to him? A very simple thing. And it's so mind-blowingly simple that a lot of people can't grasp it, especially the, you know, those of the circumcision that we talked about. And they're like, mm, no, no, you're going to have to get circumcised. You're going to have to start growing little curly things. You know, you can't shave. You can't. You know, no tattoos for you. But these guys come in, and you got to think about that, man. These sailors, and they got bones, and they got things, and they got tattoos, and they got half a shaved head. And then here's these Hellenists, and they're sharing the gospel with them and going, yeah, he loves you, and he died for you. And they've never heard anybody Jewish, anybody saying anything like that to them. All the gods required sacrifice and giving. And here it was, believe, turn, and experience something like you've never, ever had before. And it changes the people and so dramatically changes them that news of it reaches all the way to Jerusalem. Check it out, verse twenty, verse 22. The news, and this is going to be a section, verses 22 through 26, called on courage calling. Uh, The news of these things come to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. So stop right there. Um, You know, the same thing that affects the Jews affects all of mankind. Um, The book of Genesis talked about it, and that's one of the things that we talked about with the gospel. The book of Genesis goes, and it says that mankind fell, period. We're all sons of Adam, you know, which is also cool because, you know, it becomes one of those things where we do recognize that the differences between us is ethnic and cultural. Now, a lot of people say, no, 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 it's on a genetic level. It's on a genetic level because it's been happening for so long, so the genetic traits are now there for us. But all of us also share a common genetic identity. We're all human beings, period, no matter what you look like on the outside. No matter what you look like on the outside, you're a human being, which also means you're lost, period. And that's the thing, you know, because we don't begin to understand it. And 
again, when we look back at Adam and Eve, they weren't perfect, you know. They weren't. They were perfect in their design. They were perfect in their making. Does that mean that they were sinless? No. 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 But the Holy Spirit of God dwelt within them. It says that He breathed life into them. And that dwelt in them. That was life. Okay. But then what happened? They had one thing. I mean, literally one thing. Don't eat. And when they ate it, that life left them. They literally, at that very moment, they didn't die physically, they died spiritually. Because he said, the moment you eat it, you will surely die. And so that life that was God left them and could not come back into them and dwell with them at that time. Why? Because as soon as that atonement was made, remember it says that he covered them with furs. For them to be covered with fur meant that, that something had to die them to be covered and he covered them and then his spirit could be with them and fellowship with them for that time but then they would sin again and it would have to go and that's the same thing that he's like he's been looking to save all of humanity all of mankind and he wants to dwell with us it says in john chapter 15 i want to live in you and you and me so for that to be able to happen what does he have to do he has to have that atonement that lasts forever that atonement, it says, that was done from the very foundation of the world. It's that whole idea of that when he died, it covered those sins. And so when you repent and turn from to him from your sin, it is a complete and utter cleansing that saves you at that very moment for eternity. Why? Because he now comes to dwell within you. And because you have the cross that covers you, you don't have to have a constant sacrifice. Because, you know, because like I told you, man, I would be poor. Because I, I, you know, I would just have to buy like a whole flock of them turtle doves, right? Because you know that was the, what poor people had to give as a sacrifice. Because I go in, sacrifice the doves, thank you very much. Walk out, and five minutes later, I'm walking back into the temple. Hey, here's some more doves, right? Because I'm going to go out and sin again, even if it's just in here. And here he comes into this, and it's like these people are being changed utterly by the gospel. John three sixteen, man, is so real. It is so real. It is so true. He loved the world so much that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him would never die. Why? Because now that Holy Spirit that had to leave Adam and Eve and could no longer dwell with mankind now can dwell within us because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's mind-blowing in the consequences of it because, again, if I'm a legalist, then I'm like, but you're not following the rules. You haven't been circumcised. You didn't give 10%. We talked about that too. You didn't give your 10% this week. So I'm not sure if you're really a believer. That's nuts, man. And they come into this and here, this is impacting the people so much. They are changing for God so much that news, and you got to think, man, news didn't travel everywhere easy back during this time. It's not like somebody's doing like a, a, a first century vine, right? Hey, check it out. People speaking in tongues here in Antioch. That's not happening. Nobody's tweeting that at the time. You know what I'm saying? So literally somebody has to travel for days to get back to Jerusalem to say, and this is impacting people so much that they are going back to Jerusalem saying, it's going down in Antioch. <laughs> it is happening, brother. People get saved, y'all, right? And, and it's like, so who do they send? All the apostles are gone. So who do they send? No, they send Barnabas, right? Because look at what it says there, okay? They sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Man, and who is Barnabas? We met him back in Acts chapter 4 and 5. His name is Joseph, but they called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And here is this guy, man, who has become a really big part. And remember, too, in Acts chapter, I think it was uh, around Acts chapter 8, that he actually went and, and got everybody to accept Saul, who was the, perse the persecutor of the church. And he encouraged the believers there, you know, and said, hey, y'all come together now. He is one of those people, he was a peacemaker. And he brought Saul in and everybody accepted him there. 
He's an encourager. And so they send the encourager to say, go find out what's going on. Go and encourage the people. Go see what's happening. Go see what's up. Right? Verse 23. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all with that purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. Stop right there. Okay? So first thing, he comes in, he had seen the grace of God, and he was glad. He didn't come in and go, oh, yeah, man, I'm glad you accepted Jesus, but, right? There was none of that. There was none of that, you know, because imagine if you were a believer and, and you were not circumcised, and they came to you and said, hey, you know, that's great, but now we've got to circumcise you, okay? You know, and if you don't know what circumcised is, go look it up. I'm not going to do a graphic description right now, but it's not something that most guys would want to do, all right? Not my thing, okay? So as we come into this, as we do this, then he comes in and he, does, he accepts them for who they are and takes them right in. He was glad. Are we glad when we see people get saved? Some of us aren't, especially if it's somebody that hurt us or somebody we think doesn't deserve to be saved or forgiven. Oh, my gosh. For some of us, when some members of our family that may have hurt us way back in the day or someone that hurt us back in the day, and we hear they got saved nine times out of ten, we're like, right, I'll believe it when I see it, right? And that's what most people, that's guys, that's the same mentality that most Jews had about Gentiles. Gentiles were dirtbags, man. They were level, they were dog level kind of people, right? You know, it was like, Gentiles, whatever, you know. If they become a Jew, then they're okay. And that was pretty much it. So when he accepts them, that's a huge deal. And he is there representing the church, as it were. Right? So when he comes and he sees the grace of God that's going on, and here's Barnabas, the encourager, named by the apostles. He was such an encouragement, even to the apostles, man. Where they would name him that. And now God's got him coming to Antioch. It's nuts, man. And why, though, you look at it and you go, okay, if God's grace and his hand is moving, why do these people need encouragement? Because we all do. We all do. Just two things. Let's just look at I'm going to show you two things of why the church in Antioch needs encouragement. Because they're Gentiles. And for this early church, that's a huge deal. When you get into this and you begin to see it, you also begin to understand kind of how we as a church got formed and why we do what we do. Because the early church was made up of Jews, right? And where did Jews go on Saturday? They went to synagogue. What was synagogue? The synagogue, they would come in. The rabbi would read some scripture, encourage them, Tell them to avoid sin and then send them on their way. So when they became believers in Jesus Christ, where did they go? Synagogue. And they shared the gospel. And they got in fights. And they lost their homes. And they got kicked out of town. And where did they go when they went to the other places? They went to synagogue. (laughs) And they shared Jesus Christ. And they got in fights. And got kicked out. So, when these Gentile believers are becoming believers in Jesus Christ, what are they learning? Where do we go? Synagogue. Who was our example of who went to synagogue? Jesus. So, Jesus went to church every Saturday. But, if my Jewish believer, my fellow Jewish believer, I'm a Gentile. So, they don't want me to go to synagogue. Okay? So, where am I going to go? I'm going to do my own synagogue thing. I'm going to do it at somebody's house or we're going to rent a building. Literally, there were even, you know, because, you know, you have churches that rent schools now, you know, and and they did the same thing. They would rent gymnasiums, literally. They would rent gyms and have church there. Or they would do it in somebody's house. Somebody had a really big living room. That's where they'd go. So here, but, and, and this is the thing that puts it together for you so you understand how kind of how we do church came about because if my fellow jewish christian was going to synagogue on saturday because he's still trying to be a G- obedient to being a jew so what day do we meet so that we can have fellowship with them 
let's do it on the Lord's Day. Because he rose from the dead on Sunday. And so that's where that habit became a thing. You see, because we're not under the law. I don't have to, for me to perfectly worship Jesus, I should be worshiping it every day. But when we come together as a fellowship, we come together on the Lord's Day. Every time we walk through that door, we're telling people Jesus is alive. Which is awesome to me. It's awesome to me. And here, here, these guys, they not only have to fight the Jews, right? Because now I'm a Gentile believer, and these Jews, they don't like me. I love them because my Savior is a Jew. Which is also a huge deal for the Gentiles because they didn't really like the Jews that much either. Okay? They blamed them for a lot of things. You know, if something went bad, eh, it's probably the Jews' fault. I mean, you hear it today, right? You know, eh, Jews must have done it, right? Because that's just what we do, man. We blame people groups, and we do that. You know, and it's been the same since the beginning. And you think it's going to get better if somebody else gets voted into office? Forget about it. It ain't happening, right? Here we come into this. Here we see this. And this Barnabas, this guy filled with the Holy Spirit of God, comes in and accepts them. And he makes peace. And he shows them how to get through this. So that's why they needed encouragement in that respect. The other respect is because of Antioch itself. The city, as we started out, the city is like the third largest in the Roman Empire. Get this in your head now. It was a port city that was filled with riches. Okay? It was the, one of the grandest cities of its time. All right. As I told you, it had sometimes as much as a 500,000 people in the city, which is huge for city. It's huge for any city, but it's huge for a city of the time. All right, because it's got to have enough resources to support those people. It was filled with retired Roman politicians and military, which meant lots of money and lots of debauchery. Because nothing like a rich person to bring in fine, upstanding morals and righteousness, right? No. No. They brought in their acts of worship. They brought in temple prostitutes. They brought in gambling. They brought in sin. It was second only to Corinth in the idea of looking at it. You know how we look, everybody looks at Vegas and says, Vegas is, what do we call Vegas? That's right. This was the sin city of its time. Corinth was bad, but Antioch was rich and bad. Okay? You know, it was second only to Corinth in terms of morality. It was the only city. Here's how bad it was. It was 24 hours bad. It was a city that never sleeps. It was the first city and the only city of its era that was known to actually have streetlights. Because nobody went to bed. They sin around the clock. It was on par with Athens in terms of its intelligentsia, its academia, you know. So uh, it was known for its education and its richness and colleges and, and training in philosophy. So why did they need encouragement? Because of the city they lived in itself. They lived in a place of moral debauchery. And the carnality of this city affected the men and women who were saved in it. And it pressed on them. It has to. And yet, this church that's going to be born here, this church that is being birthed that you and I are seeing happening, it actually becomes one of the biggest churches that there ever was. Just in the book of Acts, we're going to see where they're going to finance and send Paul out on his missionary journey. The people that are getting saved are willing to do almost anything for the gospel and for the gospel to go out. And what's going to be funny is by the 3rd or 4th century, it was headed by a man that was called John Chrysostom. And John Chrysostom was this preacher. He was called, well, Chrysostom itself means golden mouth. If that tells you anything about this pastor, right? He was the pastor of the church and they called him golden mouth. That was his nickname. Because he spoke so well and so eloquently. But, you know, it's kind of funny that <laughs> he spoke so eloquently that another bishop at another church actually kidnapped him and made him come be the pastor at their church. 
literally kidnapped him. I mean, tied the dude up and kidnapped him to come be pastor. And what did he do? He said, it was by the grace of God that I was brought here. And so it is, you know, because the emperor stepped in and said, you got to let him go. But he said, it was by the grace of God that I was brought here. So it is by the grace, his grace that I will stay. He didn't look at it as being kidnapped. He looked at it as God needed me here. And let me tell you, he preached there in such a way. Because <laughs> you look at it and you go, wow, what a great guy. What did, and what happened? Oh, well, he preached in such a way that literally they said, you know what? Yeah, um, let's just charge him with heresy and exile him to some weird island somewhere. And that's exactly what they did. He irritated them so badly with his preaching because he preached against sin. They didn't realize, you know, when he was preaching in Antioch, it wasn't because he was such a, he preached against sin. If you read his sermons, and there are collections of his sermons, dude was like big time hitting on sin. He was like, you guys come in here, you know, and you, you pay more attention when you go to the horse races than you do when you come in here. And these are the eternal things of God in your face, right? That kind of thing. That was the way he was, man. And, and so literally, they, you know, he died in exile. But the church in Antioch at the time was estimated to be almost 100,000 people. That's like a fifth of the city. It's crazy. Literally, it had some, the church itself was larger than the church that's in Turkey. It's now a mosque. But it was a place that was big. It was like as big as a few football fields. It was ginormous. There were no seats, no chairs. When everybody came to church, I mean, you know, Imagine if you had to come in here and, and listen to me for 45 minutes and stand the whole time. I know some of you just wouldn't be here, and that's cool. <laughs> well, most of you probably won't. Well, all of I don't know if I'd be here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But here they come in and they they're standing, and it's just you know. But that's by the third or fourth century, but eventually it would become almost abandoned. You know, here we come into this, and Barnabas is at the beginning of this. And his encouragement causes the church to grow. And even you and I can look at it, too, and, and gain from this, that in the midst of the city that they're in, Barnabas comes in and says, you can do it. And that's what I tell you right now. You can do it. You can go out and share the gospel. People can be saved by your word and what you do. I'm not saying because you're perfect. I'm not saying because you're some perfect witness that you're a super witness or something like that. But you go out and share the gospel. Be who you are and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And watch what he does with it. Because it's his hand that saves, not mine, not yours. And encourage them, it says here, to continue with the Lord. Right? What does that mean to continue with the Lord? It means exactly that. You turned to him. Keep going that way. It's an encouragement all throughout Scripture, and it's encouragement that I give to you, as he just as he did, and, and I mean it as an encouragement. I don't mean to sit there and say, you know, you sinners, you you know, you brood of vipers. Though sometimes we need that. We do, myself included. But I want to encourage you now to continue after him. I'm not telling you to turn from that. I'm telling you to turn to that, to him. Because to turn to him is to turn from everything else in the world. It's to find fulfillment in him. Because if you're looking in fulfillment from your wife, your husband, your children, you're going to fail. It's going to fail you. It's going to fail you. And you're going to put them at a standard that they just can't meet. And they will fail you. But if you put your faith in him and you look for your fulfillment from him, then he will give it all to you that you need. And everything else will take its order behind them. So continue in Christ. Am I going to tell you how to do that? If you ask. If you need to look at the scriptures together and find those things, sure. And sometimes it's going to hurt. Sometimes it's going to feel like a slap in the face. This is just how it is. But it's one of those good slaps, you know. It's like one of those fights you get into where you like the person afterwards, right? Those don't happen a lot anymore because we're such a weird society now. But it used to be, you know, I could get into fights with people and we become best friends. 
you know, walk away with bloody lips going, man, that was cute, wasn't it, right, yeah. I like how you swung like that, you know, and that kind of thing, right? I, I can remember one of my best friends, it was the guy that actually literally tried to kill me. Not to say that I, you know, when I was in a teen, I had a smart mouth, okay, believe it or not, right? And so one of the things that I would do was I would go hang out with the, with the stoners, right, and I would make fun of them. And then I would go hang out with whatever group there was, and I would make fun of everybody. Now, the big mistake I made was when I went and made fun of the jocks, okay? They liked it when I would make fun of somebody else, but they didn't like it when I made fun of them. And there was this one guy, and his name was Brian Miser. And his dude was so big. He was so big. We called him the trunk because his arms were as big as a tree trunk. He could curl 100 pounds with one arm. And he was 15. And he was covered with hair. And it was so hilarious. One time, you know, we did this thing where, you know, where you use the lighter fills and you <clears throat> blow fire. And he did that, and his face caught on fire. It was so funny. Anyway, you know, so, but, you know, so we're sitting there, and we're at school. Right. And, and 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 lunch has just started and we're all standing out there by the baseball field. And I just lit into him. I can't even remember what I said, but there was something that I said where at one point I distinctly remember the look where he kind of just turned to me. <clears throat> and that death thing came on his. I'm going to hurt you so bad. I'm going to put you in the hospital right now. And he was the kind of guy that could do it. And he was fast for a big guy. But I was faster. Praise the Lord. <laughs> right. Because it, it makes me be able to be here without some kind of weird lisp or something like that where he broke my face or something. And he chased me for the entire lunch hour. I kid you not. We ran and we ran. The only time I stopped is when he stopped to get a breath. Until finally we got to a point there was this huge ditch. And I mean, it was big. And I ran and I jumped it. I, did, I thought I was going to die because I thought I was just going to hit the other side because it was concrete on either side. I thought I was just going to hit the other side and die. But I made it all the way over. And then after I made it over, I turned around and looked at him and said, In your face, miser! And he just started laughing and he laughed. And then I started laughing and then everybody was laughing. And then after that, I pretty much could say anything they wanted to anybody because he would hurt them. Oh, he would hurt him so bad. The entire football team became my protectors. It was awesome. It was awesome. For like a year, man, I was untouchable. Literally, I had one guy trying to choke me one day because of my mouth again. And somebody from the football team came and hurt him pretty bad. I mean, he was like twitching. We all ran. But, you know, anyway, let's move on. But that whole, I know it's like, okay, terrible story, horrible, bad, yes. But the thing is is that you and I, when we come to the Scriptures and we want to continue with the Lord, sometimes it means hurt. But hurt, you know, faithful, the Bible says, are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes you and I have to be a little callous with each other. Iron sharpens iron because it strikes against itself and it sharpens itself with it. You know, if you just rub real lightly and stuff like that, it doesn't do a lot of good, right? So sometimes we've just got to be real with each other. We've got to be men. We've got to be women. We've got to be holy people of God. Verse 24, let's get through this. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So these great many people, they're still turning to the Lord. They're being added to the Lord. Barnabas knows the truth of Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to, go, for good to those who love God. And those who are called according to his purpose. The idea and the things of this that are happening are real. Okay, this is happening. And everything that Barnabas is putting his hand to is happening because it's for the good of those that love him. Verse 25, Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. It's like, what? All these things are going on in Barnabas' jets. Verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled within the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So if you go look at where Antioch is and where Tarsus is, it, it's not a small distance. It's not something you just do. It's not like I'm going to catch the red eye and go to, you know, to, you know, to Tarsus. And it, the word seek that he uses there is literally the word for hunt or find. Um, you remember when Jesus got lost when he was a baby and they went looking for him? They sought him out. Y'all remember that story? You know, 
Everybody remember that story? Okay, wake some of the people up. Okay, and now because you know, it's like, oh, he's saying, okay, yeah, 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 I remember. But you know, as we come into this, it's one of those things of it's that same thing. They're like, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And and that's where he's doing. He goes to Tarsus and he's like, hey, where's Saul? Where's Saul? Where's Saul? And he can't find him. And he's got to hunt him down. And why does he do that? Because he knows the calling of Saul. He knows that Saul is called to teach. And he's called to teach in such a way as to give understanding even to people that don't understand. That's one of the reasons that so many people kind of get confused when they read the writings of Saul or Paul because they read it from a Greek perspective. When you read the writings of Paul, if you read it from a Jewish perspective, it changes the meaning of so many things and helps you to understand what he's trying to say. Here he goes and he gets a teacher, a pastor. These people need a pastor, and they go. He goes, and he gets Paul, and Paul begins to change the day there. Now, most commentators think that when he goes into here, this is like 10 years after he got saved, okay? So this is 10 years, man. For 10 years, his ministry, everything about him is pretty much nondescriptive. There's not a lot said about him here. But yet, as we come into this, here is when Paul is going to begin to shine. And we're going to see him come back onto the stage and things are going to be just so different here. As a side note, look at what it says in in verse 26. The end of it there. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, a lot is made of that word because it's actually only used like three times in the Scriptures. Because... We were not called Christians, nor did we call ourselves Christians until like the end of the second century. And that was when um, some of the early church fathers actually began to use that term to describe Christians. It was a compound word. The first part of it is Greek, Christos, anointed one, Messiah. It's basically what it means. The ending word is Roman or Latin, okay? Um, And it's... uh, Ianos or Ian or Ios or Ioe, which basically means belonging to. Um, that belonging to, basically when they said they're Christians, it just meant they belong to the group of Christ or they belong to those called after Christ. It was a common term. Um, some people look at it as almost like a vulgarity or like a cut down or something like that, but it wasn't always used that way. Um, If somebody were like of the party of Herod or Nero, you know, they would be called Nerodians. Um, They would be called um, Herodians. You know, it was the idea was there were followers after that person. But it's not just that, right? It's they're committed to that person. What does that mean? When it's used in an almost derogatory manner, it's like, Okay, little Herod. That's basically kind of what it's saying. Oh, you're just a Herodian. I always knew Rather was like that, right? Okay, that means you just want to be like Herod. It's really, it really was a cut down in that way. And I I want to say, because some people say, oh, no, it wasn't a cut down. But Tacticus actually called it a vulgarity when referring to people that follow Christ. He said, if you want to be vulgar about it, call call them Christians. Because it seems like most of them didn't like to be called that. Because it was kind of like a, oh, whatever, little Jesus kind of thing is what they're saying. Oh, yeah, you're going to save everybody, right? Because I want to share the gospel. I want people to be saved, yeah. Okay, little Jesus, right? Little Messiah. That's basically what they're saying. But you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, we know it means to be committed to, to belong to. And I really do belong to him. You know, I don't want to look at it as something that just identifies me. But I want it to identify me. I want to identify by it. By that word Christian. I mean, does it really mean something to you? You know, or is it just something that we put on a dog tag so that I get a cross when I die? What does it mean to be a Christian? Am I so committed to him The idea of it is, would somebody, you know, call me that who just knows me? 
You know, it's that old adage that somebody has said, you know, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's this idea of it as we come into this. You know, these people are so wanting to be so much like Jesus that they're, it's almost like calling them nuts. Okay, little Messiah, right? I get it. Thanks for sharing the gospel with me. Now just buy some fish and leave kind of thing. Are you like that? Are you so annoying about Jesus that most people don't even want to have you over for family events anymore? You know what I'm saying? Because think of it. Because if he's real, if he's true, then it's the most important thing in the universe for everybody. Because he's not just the God of Christians. He's not just the God of the Jews. He's the God of the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would never perish but have eternal life. And that's for everybody, man. Is it so important to me? Do I love my friend, my compatriot, my fellow workers, my things so much that I would annoy them with the gospel because I don't want that person to go to hell? Or do I just want to be buds with them? Do I just want to hang out? What's going on with me when I want to do that? It bugs me, man. It bugs me. You know, what, how you guys do it, man, do it. But it bugs me when I don't say something. Because I'm like, I mean, I've talked to people. I have literally talked to people. I've gone in to see someone in a hospital, looked at them, and known that they were going to be dead in just a few minutes. And that could happen for any of us. None of us guaranteed another five minutes when we hit that road later. I mean, you could have a schizoid embolism and be gone now. We actually had a friend um, who was a couple, and this gentleman kissed his wife and said, I'm going to go up and read the kids a bedtime story. And as he was walking up the stairs, he had an embolism and died on the stairs on the way to go pray with his kids and read them a bedtime story. After a few minutes, the wife went up because she'd like to go peek in to watch him read to them and found him dead on the stairs. Thanks any of us, y'all. I don't care if you're 15 or 50. None of us has another moment guaranteed. So what are I? What am I? What am I? What do I identify myself by? Am I a Republican or am I a Christian? On another side note, which we don't have time for, but if you look at verses 27 through 30, we'll cover that next week. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of stuff, so I kind of can't get into it. But as we end this message, I've got to end the message because, guys, we're out of time. Um, as you get into this, remember what Jesus said. John chapter 4, verse 23, The hour is coming now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. And you and I see that played out in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because do you really have a relationship with him or is it just a religious act? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Have you experienced that sealing? Have you experienced that Holy Spirit? Because it talks about it there as an act or an action. is something that has happened to you. As I like to say, you don't get hit by a Mack truck and just go, Woo, what was that? You know, you got hit by a Mack truck. You know you got hit by a Mack truck. You don't meet Jesus Christ and just go, Okay, I'm good now. Yeah. As Rather said Friday, you know, it's that Jesus in your pocket kind of thing. That's not what he is. These guys had a plethora of gods, and they were literally called atheists because they rejected every god for Jesus Christ. And they became atheists because they believed exactly what Peter said in the book of Acts, which is there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Do you believe that so much that you would be willing to be called a Christian in derision? By those that you love. Hmm. In Acts 20, 24, Paul's going to say, when there's chains awaiting him, when he's going to go share the gospel, 
He's going to go share the gospel with Caesar. And they're saying, you're going to go and you're going to be in chains and you're going to be this and you're going to be beaten and you're going to be... And he says, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Because he was washed. Because he was made whole. Because he was clean. None of these things move me. Man. Bless you. If you would, please stand and pray with me. Father, as we come to you right now, Lord, I just I thank you so much for your word. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that has heard the gospel today, that has heard that salvation that is offered in you, that truly believes that you rose again from the dead. Because, Lord, your word says that if they believe in their hearts that Jesus was raised from the dead, they will be born again, Lord. And I just pray that you would do that in someone right now, Father. If there's anyone here who is unsure, I pray that they would at this very moment be born again. Not a, as a as religious observance, Lord, but in the reality that your Holy Spirit would be given to them, that they would be filled and know without a doubt that they are saved. And Lord, for those believers, those brothers and sisters in Jesus who may be struggling today, who may be just struggling with their faith, Lord, struggling with wanting to walk real with you and to follow after you, I pray that you would help them just to focus on you again. Lord, By to battle those sins, not by striking against the sin, but by walking towards you. By, Lord, living for you. As we do this, Father, as we come to you, let us remember, Father, that the enemy will come in between us. He will try to stop that forward motion, which is why we wear the full armor of God and we keep moving forward. And when we can't, we stand. And wait for you to give us the battle. Father, I just lift everyone here up to you and pray that they would go out and understand that they are washed in the blood of the Lamb and that their garments have been made white as snow by Him. Fill them, Father, with your Spirit. Let them walk in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now if you would, let's do this benediction. All right? Everybody wake up. Stretch. There you go. Crack in the back. All right. Well, yeah, yes. Okay, there you go. All right, let's do this. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance Upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Get out.